I got to be within the circles of people who have wealth. Their mentality is completely different, the way they view life, than the person who comes in and, you know, they're paycheck to paycheck. Because when you live that life of paycheck to paycheck and put away a little bit of money for a vacation, let's say, your mentality is if something good happens, the other shoe's going to drop. So you have to take advantage of it. And if something bad happens, then, well, you're due. It, it'll turn around eventually. So you, you take that mentality into trading. And what happens? Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast. Hi, I'm Tessa, co-host on Chat with Traders. And you're listening to episode 255. I have a strong feeling that you're really going to enjoy this episode. Today, in interviews Vincent Brusisi. Some of you may know Vincent as Harry Selden of Real Day Trading, a unique community of dedicated day traders on Reddit. As a former gambler, professor of statistics, and a talented poker player, and having had a successful career as an expert in the movie industry in Hollywood, Vincent took his poker skills and expertise on statistical predictive modeling of human behavior and ventured into trading with a goal of finding an edge. But after blowing up his accounts multiple times, he had to go back to the drawing board and hone his trading skills, mindset, and discipline to become a high-probability trader before putting in another dime into the markets. Vincent is also an advocate for the small traders and shares a more holistic and contextual approach to the markets and focuses on following the money, which has led to his consistency in day trading. And, oh boy, there's so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so pleased to present Mr. Vincent Brusisi from Los Angeles, California. Hello, Vincent. How are you uh, doing today? I'm spectacular, Ian. How are you? Great, great. Thank you, Vincent, for coming on uh, Chat with Traders. Happy to be here. Love to get a little background uh, about you, your early background as a as a kid. Yeah. Share with us, uh, what was it like growing up? I had an interesting childhood. I have, um, I don't know if you read it or not, but a rather um, famous relative in uh, Einstein. And growing up, I, you know, showed some aptitude in physics and uh there was a lot of pressure there for me to do well in fact i you know wound up getting a scholarship to go to cornell and um in physics and when i got there uh the first thing they did was introduce me based on my lineage and um i basically turned around and walked out you know i'm not gonna uh compete with uh e equals mc squared not really ever gonna beat that but mm -hmm. um Growing up, I was also pretty pretty poor. Um, for a while, we lived in a car. Me, my uh, brother, and sister. You know, we you know splitting a candy bar among the three of us was a kind of a big deal. So in New York and Long Island, uh, it gets kind of cold. <laughs> yeah. Did uh, growing up poor uh, trigger any early interest in financial markets or managing money? Not really. You know what? Not really, because I wound up hating money in a way, and I was I gambled. Um, I mean, God, I gambled away all my student loan money. Uh, you know, I would get it and go down to Atlantic City. So I was terrible with money. And and personally, me, I I don't look at my finances. I I refuse to look at my own. I don't know how much I don't know how much money I have, and I really don't. My wife could be taking money out every damn week, and I would have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen my bank account in years. I refuse to look at it. So I have a very odd relationship with money, but I certainly know what it's like to not know where your next meal is coming from or to, you know, uh, wear hand-me-down clothes and all of that. It, uh, growing up poor certainly left a, a imprint on me. Mm -hmm. uh, you also go by the name of Harry Selden. How did you uh, pick that name? So it, it Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, when I was a kid, I had read that series. And in that series, the lead character, Harry Selden, creates a, a science called psychohistory. It's a predict human behavior. And I became obsessed with the idea. 
And even though I was being pushed into physics, I, I wound up actually doing uh, my graduate work on um, statistical modeling of human behavior and predictive modeling. So I became a professor of sociology and of statistics, and that was my specialty based on my early childhood obsession with this idea that you could predict human behavior. Um, and oddly enough, I parlayed that into uh, the movie industry by um, writing models that wound up predicting opening weekend box office. Oh, wow. So how early, how old were you when you first got into gambling? Oh, you know, I have, so I had my, my Jewish side of the family and the Italian side of the family in, in Brooklyn. And um, uh, very, the, the only thing that shared in common, I guess, was, was trying to shove food down everyone's throat. But uh, the method of communication in my Italian American family in Brooklyn was, uh, was gambling. Uh, you know, after dinner, the cards came out and everyone played. So by, you know, eight, seven, I was playing, uh, eight, seven, eight, I was playing poker. Oh, wow. Uh, so were you aware of the house odds and statistics? Yes. Early on? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I look, I, every gambler out there doesn't gamble. I mean, the true degenerates out there who know, you know who you are. They, they, they can hear me. And, they want to hit rock bottom. Gamblers, true gamblers, want rock bottom. I knew going into that casino that they have a house edge. I knew that, you know, every time I placed a bet, I, you know, there was that 50.5, 51.5 odds against me. Um, and, yeah, sometimes I thought, oh, I'm going to play the don't pass line. So, so fucking what? I'm still going to lose, right? Um, and I knew, just like every gambler knows, even though was, I have a system, you, know, you have a system of going broke. Um, and I'd be there at two in the morning with my damn Kino card because I had like five dollars left and I spent it on that instead of food. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mentioned I remember reading one of your uh, quotes there in your blog that uh, after cashing in your winnings, uh, you would be broke by the time you got to the elevator uh, because you left a trail of chips on different tables. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. What is that? I mean, uh, describe that. Well, because I mean, I, I, I can, I'm pretty good at playing poker. Um, and I would go to the poker room and, and play at Bellagio or wherever. And I'd win, uh, I'd win money and on the poker tables and then I'd get up and walk back. And of course, Oh, there's the blackjack table and there's the craps table. And by the time I got to my, <laughs> the elevator, I, all the winnings would be gone. It, it, Thank God it got to the point when I finally, um, my wife uh, basically would take the money uh, from me after I, I won in poker. Uh, so I wouldn't have it leaving the poker room because she knows I would, it would be gone. But yeah, if I'm left un, uh, unsupervised, not a good idea at uh, all. So you were seduced by these other games to, uh, to gamble there instead of st sticking with just with poker, which is what you were very good at. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it was the thrill of it, right? It was a kind of, um, you know, the idea of, of, of money won is twice as sweet as money earned and playing poker felt like money earned, you know, that's work, but <laughs> hitting it on blackjack. Yeah. That, that, that feels great. So yeah, I mean, look, it, I don't gamble now. Um, but back then, yeah, it was, I was a degenerate. Describe for us, what is the gambler's mentality? You know, the gambler's mentality is very much this idea that somehow you're due, that somehow this play, this one, this time, you're going to hit it. And deep down, you know, you're not right. But that, 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 that you're owed. The universe owes you, but at the end of the day, you know, what the gambler is really just trying to do, they're, they're trying to, to th get one over on the house and the house in this case is the casino, but the house could be anything else in life because usually the, the gambler, I mean, life has beaten them down. And instead of taking that responsibility onto themselves and saying, I fucked up, 
Uh, no, it was life. It was I had a shitty boss. I had a shitty teacher. I had bad parents. I had this. Life has screwed me over. But with a little luck, I can get back on top. I can I can re, I can do it. I can be, you know, a uh, zero to hero type story here. And it it just is this constant downward spiral because they never want to deal with their own issues that it caused them to get to the points that they're at. I see. So is, is the mentality mentality similar to I've had all these bad lucks in a row, a a string of um, moves and trades uh, that went against me and now it should turn around. I can't, you know, five or six times in a row uh, and the next one should be a winner. Is that that kind of mentality? Yeah, it's, you know, It's very interesting because having been in the movie industry and and being been successful there, um, I got to be within the circles of people who have wealth and money. And I'm not talking about just like rich, but wealth, real wealth, the people who sign the checks, the people who have, you know, enormous, you know, the type of wealth where they could buy and sell you. And their mentality is completely different the way they view life than the person who comes in and you know they're paycheck to paycheck because when you live that life of paycheck to paycheck and put away a little bit money for a vacation let's say your mentality is that if something good happens the other shoe's going to drop so you have to take advantage of it and if something bad happens then well, you're due. It, it'll turn around eventually. So you, you take that mentality into trading. And what happens? When, you're, when, you, when you lose, when you're losing, you sit there and you hope it turns around. So you hold on to your loser. But when you're winning and, and your position's in a profit, what do you do? You, you, you want to take profit quickly. Oh, no, I never got broke taking, uh, taking a profit. Yeah, you fucking did. Because you all, they take profit so fast. Because the moment they got that profit, well, it, the market's going to take it away from them. And they, they close the position. But when they're down, well, then they leave that position on because it's got to turn around. So they, they take that mentality into trading, whereas a person with wealth when they're trading and their position's up, they want to press it, add to it, keep it going. Cut the loser. I don't want those losers. We, but keep keep the winners. Completely mm-hmm. opposite mentality. I see. Uh, so uh, my understanding is that you had to burn that gambler's mentality uh, out of you. Was that difficult? Yeah, it was. Um, look, when I when I first started trading, uh, well, I don't know, five six six years now. I guess it was six seven years now. Um, I blew out my account twice. You know. Just completely blew it out. I, I came into it thinking, well, I know what I'm doing. I, I got this. No problem. And uh, the screw-ups I had are no different than probably everybody else's. And it was still that gambler's mentality, right? It was still that chasing those low-float momentum stocks and, and you know, trying to, to uh, counter trend trade. I know better than, than what the market's doing. Oh, this is going up? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to short it. And so I had that it was basically okay i'm not going to a casino i'm going to gamble here instead and it was, it was the same mentality and then the mm-hmm. second time i blew it out i was just sitting there and i realized yeah okay um i'm not trading i'm gambling hmm, i'm just treating this like another casino right uh so your time um when you were gambling in the casino did you get disciplined uh eventually about um placing your, your bets and, uh, and how successful were you, um, toward the end? Towards the end, uh, well, one, if I'm playing poker, I was generally fairly successful. Um, Mm -hmm. and I became disciplined in terms of, uh, you know, when they used to be able to count some cards into, into a blackjack deck that the rules they have now, it's kind of prohibitive. Um, but I became pretty disciplined in, I would be able to win in a poker room. And then not basically get to that elevator with the money still in my pocket. 
Mm -hmm. And was that discipline uh, difficult to apply when in the markets when you first started getting? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult because, it, you, you know, the instinct just took over. Right. Um, it's sort of like uh, it's like a drug. And it, it immediately took over when I started, uh, you know, opened up my first uh, Ameritrade Thinker Swim here. And I'm like, OK. And, you know, then I started to figure out how am I going to get this under control? And it was, OK, can a retail trader beat the market? Is it even possible? Is it possible to consistently be profitable? Right. Because you can be profitable on any one or two trades. You know, anyone can go in there and get lucky, just like anyone can go into a casino on any given day and have a good weekend and get lucky. Um, is it possible to be consistent? So I started looking around and seeing, are there traders out there that actually do this for a living? And it turned out there are. So when I knew and found out it was possible, but then I just had to figure out how. And that kind of set me on a, this is a puzzle. This is something to figure out. And that I can do. I, I can figure out puzzles. And so that's what I set my mind to. And that's what took away sort of that gambling mentality when it became something, I, a challenge that I had to crack. Mm -hmm. um, from my understanding, uh, you had a career as a professor of sociology and statistics. Yeah. And so you had a career uh, with that. And uh, my understanding is that your early investigation of the markets uh, came across as rather boring to you. Um, it became, well, I mean, my initial thought was, well, is it predictable? And, um, it, you know, whether or not one could predict the market. And then, of course, the more I looked into it, I realized, okay, people have been trying to do this for ever. And it's the largest data set in the world. Um, there are institutions with supercomputers that are are trying to predict the market and, you know, put sociological economic theory onto it and all that. And at the end of the day, it was sort of, OK, um, no, I don't think you can create a model to predict the market. But um, I do think that you can create uh, and find methods that can give you an edge um, and statistically, that's all you need, right? You you need an edge in order to be successful. And that's what I started to become interested in. It is, it's possible to find an edge. Mm -hmm. Did you have any uh, other friends or family that were in the markets prior to you that uh, kind of gave you inspiration to get in? Uh, uh, like, uh, hey, yeah, they're they're doing pretty well too, and I can do well as well. No, no, I, I try to avoid talking to family. And um, I, uh, you know, I have a couple of friends. I mean, I'm a, I, I don't like people and I really, I, I try to avoid them. Um, the pandemic for me was, you know, Hey, I could stay in the house. Great. Um, and not see people, which being in the movie industry was not the easiest thing to do to avoid people. But I knew people who were in the market, but they were long-term investors, right? They had their money in the market. They, you know, invested in the blue chip stocks, whatever. And that, that was it. They weren't traders. So mm -hmm. I didn't know personally any traders until I came across, um, you know, like anybody coming in, I looked across various different trading communities and 95% of them are frauds and, and scams. And it was clear right away that, okay, these people are like vultures. Here you have people coming in who want to make a better life for themselves. And the first thing they get hit with is some asshole in a Lamborghini on a YouTube video telling them that they can, uh, you know, become millionaires overnight. And so I looked and looked and looked and finally found uh, a community called One Option, um, which um, I joined and, and have been in ever since. I'm a member there. I, I, I now uh, kind of run the chat room for them. Uh, but it, to me, that is a community of other professional traders that I'm able to exchange ideas with and then help traders, um, you know, turn this into a full time profession. Mm -hmm. uh, when you first started getting in trading, uh, were you doing OK financially in your career? Uh, were you motivated to get into trading for the challenge? It was a challenge. Yeah, I was doing fine. Um, 
you know, I, I, my, I ran a co-ran a studio um, at the end of my career in the movie industry. I had just released um, a movie called Unhinged with Russell Crowe, um, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't at a financial need, but it it certainly was a I don't want to do this anymore, right? I I feel I've reached a pinnacle of my career here. I've, I've created things, invented things. I've changed the way they do things in the movie industry. Now I want to try to tackle this challenge. So, um, you know, blowing out the account twice certainly wasn't fun, but, uh, I did it for the challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, share with us, how did you blow out your account? <laughs> well, um, I started like anyone else. I opened up a think or swim and, uh, put, uh, about, uh, $120,000 in it and, um, started trading and, uh, you know, I would go long Amazon or your short Google. And, and then I got introduced to options and I'm like, Oh, these are great. This is a uh, options. Fantastic. Look at this leverage. And, um, that kind of just was the death knell. Right. So within about four months, those options just crushed me. I was going, you know, out of the money options. And like I said, I was treating it like a casino. Um, and even though I knew out of the money options statistically are a shitty idea, I did them anyway. And count went to zero. And then what did I do? I put more money in. <laughs> so, um, and then quickly uh, with around another four months, blew that out too. And so then I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, fuck, um, I got to figure this out. And I am not putting another dime in until I figure out how to do this consistently correct. And the next time I finally put money in, I still haven't looked back from that deposit many years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, of the 90% of traders that are reported to lose money, uh, how much of this is due to the gambler's mentality, do you think? Um, I'd say a, a decent amount. Uh, I mean, look, the ninety percent of traders, they, I mean, Tom Hulgard, you know, says it best. They, they're, they're fearful when they should be hopeful, and they're hopeful when they should be fearful. And, you know, it, it's like chess, right? It doesn't take you long to learn how to play it, uh, or poker. The rules, uh, the methods, might take someone a month or two to learn, but mindset, the mindset takes two years at least, and it's two years of hard work. When people come into the uh, real day trading, which is the subreddit I created, um, and uh, now it's one of the top 5% Reddit subreddits on, uh, on that platform, um, they get told right away, this will take you two years minimum to learn. And it's a hard two years, because if you think about it, think about the job, you get to wake up roll into your office, which is right down the hall, sit at a computer, make money, get up when it's done, go enjoy your life, and never have to worry about financial security again. As long as you have an internet connection, you can make money. What is that worth? Like how many years do you spend slaving away to get to a middle management shitty cubicle somewhere? So if someone thinks they can just top in and bring in, spend a week and, and get rich. I mean, w w the arrogance of that idea is absurd. I had it when I tried it. it it's just absurd when I look back at the hubris of it. Like, no, th this takes hard friggin' work to do. And if someone's not willing to put in the time and the work, they're going to lose their money. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what parts... Okay, of the two years that you say that is needed, um, what is the most time-consuming aspect of that? Like, what is the most difficult and challenging uh, part to learn? Um, it, well, it is it is the mindset of of um, not cutting your winners and uh, not holding on to your losers. And you know, I lay out sort of very okay. You you. First, you have to spend at least six months learning everything. And when I mean learning, I don't just mean memorizing it, understanding what it means, understanding what an option really 
is and how it works and what market makers do. Then you go into paper trading and you have a goal. You need to be a win rate of 75%. You need to have a profit factor of two or more, and you need to do that for three consecutive months. And then when you do that, then you can go to the next stage, which is one share. You can trade one share at a time, and you have to hit those benchmarks again. And it takes about two years before people do it. But at the end of the two years, what they're really doing is slowly shifting their mindset to the right successful one that you need to become a successful trader. Mm -hmm. So your early trading, so how did you turn around your um, early trading mistakes? Um, it was first thing I needed was, um, okay, it's possible, right? I see people doing it now. Now I need a method, right? What, what is the method? Um, you know, and I looked around and I saw people like uh, Ross or whatever, and he's very good at scalping. And I looked at it and said, All right, that's not a sustainable method for most people. There has to be a, a statistically sustainable method. And what I realized is the market has a centralized ETF, right? SPY. So when, when someone says the market, in general, you're talking about the S&P 500, and let's just call it SPY. And stocks, whether they're in that ETF or not, kind of revolve around the orbit of SPY. And about 75 to 80% of them, when SPY goes up, the stock goes up. SPY goes down, stock goes down. Certain stocks on any given day are relatively weak to SPY or relatively strong to SPY. Right, and I'm not talking about the shitty RSI indicator. That's that no. Um, and so, like today, for example, Amazon. Amazon was weak to the market, and it, what happens is, if you short Amazon there, and the market goes up, yeah, Amazon's going to start slowly creeping up, but you have a buffer. It's not going to go up as much as if you shorted, uh, you know, a. AMD or a, a stock that wasn't relatively weak. So if you start looking for stocks that have proportional strength or weakness against the market, it's sort of like having that wind at your back. And if you have a, a, a bunch of people running a race, you want the person that who can, who can take the lead when there's a hundred mile an hour wind coming at them. And then if the wind reverses and hits them in the back, you know, they're going to win. So you're looking for those stocks. So I started scanning and looking for those stocks. And um, uh, that was sort of the method that got me going, which obviously is more and more refined now, to become a successful trader. Mm -hmm. uh, does this relative strength also apply for stocks not in the S&P 500 or sector-specific stocks um, in the commodities, for example? Yeah, hundred percent. It does. I mean, look, there are certain stocks like biotech sometimes go and they they do their own thing, or you know, stocks that are under ten dollars or five dollars with low floats, they'll do their own thing. But even if a stock is not in the S and P five hundred, the gravitational pull of it uh, is strong enough that it does impact those stocks, um, and you can measure relative strength and relative weakness of those stocks against buy whether they're in it or not you know you could try doing it with the with qqq and tech stocks but even there spy winds up being a better predictor of a stock's movement so yeah um, it, it's not just restricted to those 500 stocks mm -hmm. and uh to uh add additional weight uh do you ever look at it? the stock's relative strength to the sector that it trades in as well? I do, yes. I mean, it, and stocks can have relative strength to their sector where obviously if, you know, the tech sector is down um, or today, for example, financial sector was down and uh, a stock in that sector happened to be up. Now, many times when you have strength against your sector and you're not going in the direction of your sector, it, it could usually be news related. Um, and that is what makes, I mean, ask any professional trader and they will tell you right now, this, this market is probably one of the most difficult markets, if not the most difficult market to trade. And 
I am trading two accounts here. I'm trading one account through um, JP Morgan, which is a, a rather large account. There's, I have a desk uh, of analysts there, and I have a Bloomberg terminal, and I go through that with them. And then I have uh, uh, an Ameritrade account. And, you know, talking with them, no matter what, this, I, this is the most difficult market, this, this particular market in the last, let's say, four months. Well, why is that? What, what makes it so difficult? Um, because all traders, most, you know, we ply our trade still based on the um, acceptance of technical analysis. The technical analysis is based on, obviously, uh, sort of a group think. If we all think that a simple moving average, a 50 simple moving average is going to apply support, then it, it's support because we all think that. This market, though, is... I mean, look what happened today. A a non-voting Fed speaker decided to come out and be all dovish for no fucking no reason at all. They come out and they just start spouting. Uh, uh, Bostic decides to come out and start spouting all these dovish. Uh, you know, maybe we'll pause over the summer and blah blah. And the market shoots up. This market is so sensitive right now. To any type of news. I mean, when we were in a bull market, I'm sure you remember, Ian, mm -hmm. you we didn't know what the hell the CPI was. I mean, we knew what it was, but we didn't know every month, like, oh, it's a 7%. We didn't pay attention to the jobs report. It, none of it, none of it had an impact. But I mean, you know, maybe a couple, if our, the president tweeted it did, but in general, those things didn't matter. But now, every single day, there's something that could drop. A, a news piece article or an economic release or a Fed speaker that can cause your technical analysis to go right out the friggin' window. Hmm. Uh, so do you view that uh, these news events as even more important than company fundamentals, uh, earnings releases, um, that kind of thing? Um, I mean, earnings releases are always going to be probably your, your biggest catalyst on a on a stock, and I, I don't recommend playing earnings. I mean, other than there's certain types of trades that you can use that can take advantage of the earnings and give you an edge. But in general, earnings is a, is a coin flip. It's a, it's a gamble. Um, but even now, earnings aren't earnings, right? Because you can have a, a company that blows away their, their numbers and they drop. Why they drop? Well, because they're um, their guidance, which is based on all these macroeconomic forces, uh, is is not as strong as it normally would be. So even even earnings is now impacted more than it used to be by a very unstable macroeconomic environment. So one of the things I tell traders and and uh, you know to to help them along their way as they're doing this journey is to familiarize themselves with the macroeconomic factors, to know what it means when the 10-year yield is over 4%. Why is that bad for equities? They should know that. Why, why when the Fed raises rates, it, why is that bad for tech stocks more than it is for um, energy stocks and so on? These are things that normally pure chartist and, and, and uh, technical analysis would normally say, oh, I just need the chart. Just show me the chart. Can't do that anymore. Mm. When um, so, was there a time in the past then that uh, one could just use the chart? Was that uh, a year ago before the mar You know, before the market topped out in late. Yeah, I, I believe. I believe during uh, you know pick your pick your time during the uh, the stretch of the bull market. You know, other than that sort of instability during the the, the initial COVID drop. Um, but generally, when you know you had a trending market almost three to four days out of the five a week. And when you have a trending market, you just throw a dart on the strongest stock and, and off you go. Um, you just, you know, make sure you have a good corresponding chart, daily chart to um, the direction that you're going and you're off to the races. Now, not so much, but yeah, I would say you could rely primarily on the chart in front of you and what's happening with the market before we started hitting this, this Jan, let's call it January, um, you know, what was it, 2020, right in the end of 2022. 
Mm -hmm. So what do you think it's going to take to uh, break the market, either into a steady downtrending bear market or reverse course and go into a bull market? Um, I mean, I got to tell you, I freaking sick of being a, a bearish trader. I, I freaking hate it. Um, I, I think, you know, this market's not going to capitulate. It, there's, there's no reason for it to. But right now, there's no catalyst either. And as long as the treasury rates remain where they are, why would institutions, and, and let's be clear, I mean, our job as traders is to figure out what institutions are doing and follow the money, not go against them, not, you know, everyone's like, damn the man and hate the hedgies and all that. Great, whatever. Um, when you grow up and want to make money, you, you, you will realize that your job is to follow the money. And institutions have no reason to put their money into equity while they're getting 4% or higher on those yields. So what will it take for those yields to go down? Well, what will it take for the Fed to stop raising rates? And then you have inflation, right? So inflation has to markedly come down and the market has to believe that there is an endpoint, a terminal rate endpoint, and then a point where they start reversing those hikes. At that point, you will start seeing real bullish rebounds um, that will break out of the cycle. But until then, every, everything should be treated as just a bull rally in a bear market. I see. Well, why do you think uh, we haven't seen a massive sell-off in the stock market uh, to the point where we see this, say, the VIX index spike uh, sharply higher. Uh, it seems like this market doesn't really want to go down, even though people describe it as a bear market. Yeah, it's, I mean, to be honest, it's because the economy is still, still freaking good, uh, because you, you have almost uh, universal employment. Um, households are, have more discretionary funds now than they did before COVID. You, you have declining debt um, even on uh, the average debt on credit cards. So when you have an economy that's strong, that is handling these higher rates, you, you, there's no fear of recession. Now, now if, if we were gonna go and, and into the hard landing or whatever they were call it, uh, into a recession, then yeah, uh, you would see that capitulation. You would see that selling. But as long as the economy stays strong, then the earnings are on, these, on these companies are going to be decent. They might not blow the doors off, but they're not going to miss um, by and large. So as long as that happens, we're kind of stuck in this horrible chop best rap zone of nowhere land of 380 to 415 spy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you share with us uh, how you go long or short? Um, what do you look for in the charts? Sure. Um, so I have uh, my scanner over here, which is um, uh, a system called Option Stalker, a, even though that it, it's not just for options, but so it's called it's from that uh, same one option community. And it scans for stocks at relative strength and relative weakness. Um, I then use TC2000 over here, and I look for stocks. Let's say I'm going long, um, and I'll give an example of today, for example. Um, I'm looking at, uh, let's say, AMD, right? AMD, which should have a news event, but AMD started becoming relatively strong to the market, proportionally strong to SPY. It breaks through its 200-day moving average. It breaks through its downward uh, descending uh, trend line. Um, so it breaks through, through let two layers of resistance. And now I have a stock that I can go long um, using the stock or options. And when I use options, I use deep in the money options. And if it turns against me, I can hold that position because I have a correspondingly good daily chart and the market close above the 50 SMA today. So I have a market in a bullish uptrend. I have a bullish stock with a bullish daily chart. Those all combined with a relative strength, I can stay long this stock going into tomorrow and have a fairly good um, chance that 
this stock will continue its its run upward. Mm -hmm. Uh, My understanding is you like to use uh, what's called algo lines? Uh, Yeah. Um, So Dave Wise, who uh, I trade with, he's a fantastic trader. He's probably the best trader I've ever ever seen, to be honest. Um, The man has a 92% some odd win rate. Uh, He discovered that if you take trend lines and you start them at very high volume candles, that it ties it into, and he also has people that he knows in institutions, their algorithms are, you know, their systems basically will draw every possible trend line on, on a chart that you can imagine and narrow it down and narrow it down. The ones that start off high volume candles and have the most number of touches along them and so on, we call algo lines. And those are the lines that it seems stocks respect time and time again. A break through those algo lines is basically triggers on the institutional side um, of buying or selling. And you start seeing that in the volume. You start seeing institutional level volume with it. So we call those algo lines. I see. How do algo lines differ from the regular trend lines that many people are familiar with? Um, they have to start with a with a candle that is a daily candle that has volume over the 50-day moving average. Um, they can't be. They can't start with an earning candle and how, or or candle the day before or the day after it. Um, they have to have um, at least uh, three uh, t- three touches, I believe, three touches to them. Um, so there there are certain rules, but it, essentially they're very similar to it. But I would say maybe twenty percent of all trend lines are algo lines. Mm-hmm. I see. So when you say do what the institutions are doing, uh, are we referring to uh, going long stocks that are breaking like above a compression zone where the algo line, where two different algo lines meet? Yeah, um, absolutely. Look, I mean, if if a stock is in comp- in kind of compression, it breaks above that compression. It breaks through a layer of resistance. It does so with volume. Um, there is a clear continuation. You 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 have um, it confirms that breakthrough. Then you're looking to see is this does this have institutional volume? Is this have re- relative strength to the market? Because what would give a stock strength that is independent of the tailwind that the market itself is giving it? Retail traders, we all like to think that we can move stocks, right? And and it happened twice, GME and AMC. Other than that, retail traders is like herding cats. We we don't come together and pull our money into one stock or another stock. It's disparate. It's spread all over the place. So institutions are really the ones that are moving uh, the price, and they're the ones that can push that type of volume, and that's what you look for. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a funny little quote um, referencing an animal farm uh, reference uh, that all support and resistance lines are equal, but some are more equal than others. Uh, care to explain that one? Yeah, um, <laughs> that was a while ago. I wrote that in the wiki. Um, and uh, you might hear the phrase, read the damn wiki, which is a, a phrase they came up with in that community, which uh, even though people refer to it as a cult, I'm telling you, it's not a cult. Although I would like to get a commune one day. That would, that would be nice. <laughs> uh, maybe in Kansas, that could be good too. Anyway, um, the point is, is that obviously certain lines of support and resistance are more uh, stable than others, right? And you, you can create any line, you know, oh, I got fib lines, you know, fuck off with your fib lines. You, you, there are certain lines that get universal agreement the SMA 50, 100, 200, certain trend lines, horizontal lines that a stock will support. And the question then becomes, one, how strong is that level of support and resistance? That's that's the initial question. Two, what will it take for a stock to break through that? Does it take a news event? Does it take just a strong market and a strong sector? Um, Does it take earnings? And so you begin to see, all right, for a stock to break through its 200 SMA, you need to have the following, right? That's a stronger level of support and resistance than, let's say, the 8 EMA, which can be broken constantly. 
So there are different levels of not all support and resistance is created equal. And when something breaks support and resistance, it's a question of, well, what type of support and resistance did it break? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, also that uh, trading is contextual. Um, having a checklist is is simply not enough. Uh, is that what kind of what you're referring to here, that a combination of different factors uh, that uh, influence um, – that does it influence how heavy you go into the trade? I, I think – I remember when I said that, and it because it drives me nuts that every month I get people coming in saying that they've created their own, you know, uh, algo on how to trade and it can auto trade for you. This thing can trade for you. All it has to do is stock has to meet the following check, 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 and then boom, buy. And it's not that simple because everything is in context. Everything is just because, oh, that stock is relatively strong and this, but there is, you know, the CPI report coming out tomorrow or, but there's, you know, um, that stock, you know, doesn't have uh, the volume that relative to the other uh, stocks in its sector does or et cetera. Everything, you know, as a trader, you have to take everything into context when you're trading. And that is one of the reasons it also takes as long as it does, because that's something that you get with experience, right? That's something you get with time where you're able to look at the larger context of it and see, okay, this is a temporary bump here, or this is because this is profit taking. This is not a real dip in this stock. This is going to rebound. And even though that might check off all the, I should short this, it's not going to work out because if contextually you look at it, you could say, okay, this here clearly just reached a high here. This is profit taking in the stock. You need to wait for it to find support and then rebound. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, about people creating algorithms. I remember a quote that you said last year. You said, uh, do not decide on a strategy based on backtesting. Um, care to tell us why? Yeah, because you can backtest anything and, and it's going to give you a 80, 90 percent win rate. I can backtest a 3.8 EMA cross and it's going to tell me that I have a, a you know, a 90 percent win rate with that. But I don't. You, you mean, if that were true then we'd have a lot of successful traders. Backtesting you, you, is, is just begging to overfit the data. And you, one, you're not going to be able to get in and out of the positions as quickly as the uh, computer's doing when you're backtesting those conditions. It's going to go, oh, 3A cross, buy. Oh, 3A cross, sell, buy, sell. You're not going to be going that fast, number one. Two, the, the conditions in which it's doing, doing it in is not going to be the same conditions you're doing it in going forward. And so it, I find people, they always think they have found that holy, I found the, the way the, the system is, the holy grail. And, it, and then you never hear from them again because they lost their money. Um, so backtesting, I think, might be good for telling you what doesn't work, but it certainly can't, doesn't really tell you what does work. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you apply risk management? Uh, my understanding is you're not a big fan of uh, using stop losses. Nope, don't use them. Never do. Oh, why is um, that? I use mental stops, but I like to stay. Um, I like to stay flexible in my trades. I mean, uh, right now I have currently on oh six nine twelve fourteen fifteen sixteen. 18 trades um, we're currently on right now, and none of them have any stop losses. I know exactly where on each one I would want to get out or not get out, but the conditions change. I don't get out or get into a stock based on my P&L. Um, in fact, the P&L should have nothing to do with your decisions on exiting a stock. If it does, you've overpositioned your 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 trade it, you should get out of the stock when the chart or the, the thesis that you have is no longer valid that's when you should that's when you need to exit the stock now you take profit that's a little bit different now if you're taking profit my my recommendation is is that people should add to their winners more um and not take profit as quickly as they do that's, that's like number one thing 
But when you're in terms of exiting, if you're if you're exiting because you think you've lost too much money, that's that's not the right way to trade. And you, you're you're going to just fuck yourself over time and time again. You need to exit based on the chart. And so a stop a preset stop loss to me, it's sort of conditions are going to continually change. So I want to be able to stay flexible with the trade. And particularly in today's market where a stock can go bang down and up and just trigger those stops. It's just people who play futures and then they, they put in these stop and they're constantly getting their stop is triggered. It's like, dude, just, you're going to, every single time the market's going to, going to smack you down. Mm -hmm. uh, so your uh, risk management is, is just knowing visually what, where on the chart you're going to get out and you position size yourself and you feel comfortable with just manually uh, taking the trades um, to get out of your positions uh, as they unfold. I mean, it sounds like you maintain a somewhat flexibility toward that, right? I do. Yeah. And look, trading is a business, right? You have to treat it like a business. And so like a business at the end of each month, I know, and you know, over thousands of trades over the course of several years, this is my average win rate. This is my average number of trades per day. This is the average amount of profit I'm going to get per trade. And by the end of the month, I'm going to come within my target revenue within, you know, X percent, two or three percent. Some, you know, there might be some months where it, you know, I missed it by a few percent and some months where I go shoot over it. But the, the key here is if I find myself going, shoot, getting, you know, had a great month, that's actually not a good thing. I want to be consistent. And so I know what, if I use this setup on this, in this situation, I'm going to have an X percent chance of being profitable on this trade. And as long as at the end of the month, those numbers match up and stay within that range, I'm good. And then what I do is every six months, I increase my base by 15% and then subsequently increase my target range of what I expect to take out in profit at the end of each month by proportional by the 15%. So 32% a year, but at the end of the year, my base in uh, account is 32% larger than it was the previous year. And so are my profits. So they just keep growing that way. It's a slow growth, but that's a growth I'm comfortable with. I see. Uh, for uh, less experienced traders, um, don't you think that having stop losses are helpful in the beginning? Um, uh, it's often, you know, the the standard rule of thumb in in the industry is that uh, stop losses are are helpful to protect you from yourself. And uh, you've certainly developed uh, quite a talent for um, not needing them. But I imagine most traders uh, do need them, right? Well. I mean, you, the 90% that are losing, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're used to stop losses. So um, they're all following those rules of thumb. And look, I think, sure, they should use them, but they should use them as long as they're using them based on their technical analysis, which if they're a beginning trader might not be uh, up to snuff, but it, it still might be good enough to say, okay, here's where support is. I'm long on this stock. I will get out if it breaks, you know, support. So I'm going to put my stop 50 cents below support, you know, wherever that is. Rather than I have 500 shares, I don't want to lose more than $500. So I'm going to put my stop a dollar beneath the current price. That mm -hmm. is the wrong way to do it. That's the, But that is unfortunately how most beginner traders will do it. They'll put their stop based on their risk tolerance of how much they're willing to lose rather than um, where it should be, which is the technical um, placement of their stop. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, so you've created a group on Reddit called Real Day Trading. Uh, what was the motivation to create this group? It One, it was an absolute frustration with the groups that are there, you know, and, and everyone knows about Wall Street bets and, and they have other groups there, deal, day trading. And you go on there and one, there are tons of people, it's the internet, right? So you have a bunch of well-meaning idiots. And by that, I mean people who who aren't, pro if, you're, if you're not a profitable trader, why the hell are you giving advice to people on how to trade? But that doesn't stop people, right? So th th these forums are filled 
with a million, you, know, you need to do this, you need to do that. And most of them are all wrong. And you have people shilling shit on there. And so I go to the mods, the mods of these groups, and I'm like, what the hell? Like, what are you doing? These people are losing money. I'm getting, I'm getting notes from people. Now, I would write posts there, and it was, you know, these posts in these forums became like the top three posts of all time in each one. And the, I, I'm telling the mods, like, these people are losing money. I'm getting all these messages. And they didn't care. They're like, oh, they know what they're doing. They're fine. One of them even said, oh, people are here to gamble anyway. And so I got so frustrated. I said, you know what? I'm going to create a group that if people want to learn how to really do this for a living, then they can come here and realize it is going to be difficult. But if anything is posted in this group, it is vetted. And it is done by, I, had, I asked a couple of professional traders to come join me to help. And nothing posted in that group is something that isn't vetted, that isn't proven. And so I personally, I hate that phrase, I personally, how else am I personally doing? But anyway, uh, post every trade I make live in real time, entry and exit. I post the trade, uh, post, uh, today I post the position size. I post everything there, timestamps. So you can see this is when I entered and this is where I exited. And you can go back and check the chart. So there's no way to Photoshop it or anything. this is my trade record. And they see this is the method being used. This is how it's working. And then I wrote a 300 page wiki. They call it the wiki. And this is your manual on how to trade. And I do not charge people. Why? Because I don't need their money. I want, they, they need their money. I'd rather take money from people that have it. I don't want to take money from people who don't. So here's the wiki on how to trade. But if they join this group, they have to be serious about wanting to. If they are not serious, if they're a troll, if they're a messer, they get kicked out. And, you know, some people said it's got a little cultish atmosphere to it, whatever. But guess what? People in this group, you start reading the, uh, um, uh, memori- the, uh, testimonials after a year of people in this group, people who came in not knowing, like losing money are now have left their jobs and they're professional full-time traders. And I'm not one or two people. I'm talking like well over, I'm not being hyperbolic, you know, well over a hundred people in the last year have become and left their job and became professional traders and are now also posting their journals and their trades these are people who were like on their last leg and now they have financial freedom. So it is a, a, a commitment, but you know, they come into this group and then they also, the, the, you know, I don't run the one option group, but I do, I'm in that chat room. And so if they want to talk to me directly, they can come and they, that, that's the group that I'm there as well. And I'm posting on Twitter, so I'm accessible to people. And it's, you know, a, an education. It's kind of like a school. It's like a boot camp. And that's, that's, I want to change the way. I want trading to be seen as a legitimate method of employment. That, you know, you should be, you know, declaring yourself a, a trader on, to the IRS and get trader status and go full time, but not before you're ready. And I constantly tell people, stop fucking trading. You're going to keep losing your money. Don't trade anymore. <laughs> you, you need to learn. You need to, to fix your mindset first. It, it's insane. People doing the same thing over and over and over again. Yes. I, I notice uh, you spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, in writing and in videos talking about helping smaller traders and focusing on small accounts, uh, often below $25,000. And you mentioned about um, setting up extraordinary high probability trades. Uh, could you share that with us? Yes. Um, I mean, so most traders who are under 25,000, you know, they, they experience the bullshit um, pattern day trading restrictions of you can only have three day trades a week. And so they get, to get around that, they decide, oh, I'm going to have a cash account, which is just a really bad fucking idea. Um, they should have a margin account. So they can do spreads. And the reason they want to do spreads is because on any given day, you will find one or two very high probability trades. And a high probability trade is a trade that 
you know, you have uh, a stock that is um, trending with the market. It has relative strength. It it it, it has a, a good solid trend. It broke out of compression. It broke, you know, all everything is lined up with this stock that you once or twice a day you will find a trade like that. And those are the only ones you should take. One or two of them. And you take you 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 take them as a spread, as a call debit spread, or you can take them as a put debit spread. So you mitigate your risk and you mitigate your um uh you know you you can you can use a higher position size and still get a decent return with with those spreads and their high probability. And that is what traders, you know, I, I would run these challenges, start with five thousand dollars and I turned it into ten, it turned it into twenty. I would start with thirty thousand and do a you know all transparent. Here's my journal, here's all the trades. And I would keep doing these challenges. And the most difficult challenge to do is the low balance challenge. The five thousand dollars, if you try to apply it in, in typical ways, doesn't go very far. But if you're very selective, like for example, an out of the money bullish put spread, right? Where you get a stock that is bullish. Um, take uh, I don't know right now uh, maybe uh, Adobe or whatever, and that's nah, not bullish stock. Um, and it has two layers of support underneath it. Then you do a bullish put spread, a put put credit spread that is about far enough out of the money and you can get uh, 20 cents to every dollar on it. So for example, if I were to do, um, you know, let's say uh, Boeing right now and Boeing's at uh, 210 at the moment and I look at Boeing and Boeing has support at its 50 day moving average at 205 and then it has support down at 200 right below um, its consolidation here. So if I went out to March, uh, let's say 31st, and I did a 195, 190 bullish put spread, I would get a dollar credit for that spread, a dollar 28. In order for me to lose there, Boeing would have to fall below 190, which means it would have to break through several lines of support in order to break. So. The win percentage on those trades is about 90, 92%. And as long as you're getting a 25% ROI on them, you're going to come out ahead. And so I recommend you know, taking trades like that, uh, which are better in a bullish market, but there are certain ones like Boeing right now, the 190, 185 bullish put spread on Boeing, giving you a $1.28 credit, you get five contracts of that, that's $600, as long as Boeing stays above 190. Okay. If it doesn't, well, then you buy back the short put and you ride the long put until you hit the credit mark. Hmm. So uh, you mentioned that uh, these type of opportunities, you can see, you can find them every day? Yeah. Yeah. With the right scanners. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I'd like to uh, transition to uh, psychology and sure. uh, a wrap up. Uh, what do you currently struggle with the most in your trading? Um. What do I struggle with the most? Um, going on tilt is still an issue for me. Um, you know, I, I will sometimes do, uh, you know, Twitter spaces where people can uh, join in and listen to me trade. I'll, I'll talk to the trade and they can hear me sometimes just like fucking lose it on, <laughs> you know, the market. Mm -hmm. um, so going on tilt, controlling my emotions are still an issue for me. Um, and over trading uh, can sometimes still bite me in the ass uh, where I will over trade, uh, take too many trades for the day um, where I'm monitoring just, you know, way too many trades. And I'm in the morning, I'm missing opportunities because I'm managing 15 different trades. So over trading and going on tilt. But, you know, when I'm trading, I'm also every trade I make, I'm posting here, I'm posting here, I'm posting here, I'm talking to traders, I'm answering questions. So it's sort of, I have a lot going on as I'm trading all these accounts and it's, it, it sometimes gets to be a lot. Mm. Uh, so how do you practice uh, to not over trade? Um, well, um, I would say, 
Norco helps. Um, uh, that certainly is a good, uh, you know, calms me down. Um, <laughs> I mean, basically what I have to do is sort of rein myself back in and, and look at, okay, obviously not all of these are high probability trades. And then I just need to start, you know, I go through them and pare them down, even though that some of them are, 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 are losing, you know, they're underwater. I just start cutting them now because they're not high probability trades and I shouldn't have taken them. Um, so when I, you know, that's difficult for me to do. I hate losing just like anybody else. And so cutting a loser for me when technically I'm looking at the chart and I'm like, okay, my thesis is still correct. Um, and the other thing is, I've been known, I'll put a thesis out there that says the market is going to go down. And I have a bearish thesis on the market, and I'll give all the reasons why. And it sometimes doesn't happen the next day or the day after that. And so I'm, I'm holding all these shorts and gets to that point where it's like, oh, I, I know I am still right. I know it's going to go down, but, but I'm getting killed here. And eventually, yeah, it'll go down and it's fine. But it's like, that's really difficult where, where your thesis is being tested, like, like right there. And you're looking at yourself, I'm like, I'm losing all of these friggin' trades and I still know I'm right, but God, when is it going to happen? And then boom, eventually it happens and you're fine, but it's just very stressful. Particularly mm -hmm. when you have, you know, thousands of people who who just love to say you were wrong uh, he's like all right fuck off <laughs> uh have you introduced trading to your children um i am a 17 year old and i you know i tried um he's learned about it but look i offered him i said here i will give you an account um put five thousand dollars in it uh you trade it and uh when you're done um, whatever profits you have, uh, donate to charity and you will learn. Um, and you can keep some of the money for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you just have to tell me when you're ready and I'll do it. And I'll know you're ready because you've downloaded, you've chosen a platform, you've downloaded one and you, you've practiced and you're ready to go. Um, I'm still waiting. Uh, but, you know, he's 17. He's about to go to college. So I don't know. Uh, he wants to get into finance. I assume at a certain point he he'll turn to trading and my other yeah. son's three who will run in and and tell me uh uh daddy um um you know i, I mr splinty made the market go down and he's referring to a splinter <laughs> in his thumb <laughs> oh wow uh so in the future are you still desiring to move to nebraska so you can watch the tornadoes i've, I've moved it to Kans kansas but yes um i i want to move there get a nice place sit on the porch watch the tornadoes roll in and you know the nearest neighbor is miles away going into town is a big deal i just want a place where i'm far away from people and you know la is filled with people but any place that's nice and far away and i can see some i love thunderstorms severe weather i can enjoy that i'll have internet access and I could just be our hermit out there. Uh, that would be nice. But yeah. Are, are you familiar with the uh, Tornado Hunter show? I am. Yeah. Um, I I would actually be, I'd gladly do that um, and hop in one of those vans. That sounds like, that sounds like fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Of course, the other half of me is uh, thinking about putting on a, uh, a, a real day trading conference in Vegas and, you know, getting all these people out there and holding seminars for them. So, uh, you know, I'm of two minds. I'm kind of like, uh, if I'm doing something, I'm always sort of like, I don't know, people think I would go crazy in Kansas by myself out there with my wife and she'd probably go crazy too. But I, that is where I want to wind up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, uh, Vincent. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Um, well, uh, they can, uh, on Reddit, the the subreddit Real Day Trading, all one word. I go under the name um, H Selvin, and well, if you go in there, you can you'll it'd be easy to find me. Uh, just reach out to me there. You can reach out to me on Twitter, Real Day Trading on Twitter, and uh, or in the uh, uh, One Option community. Any one of those three places, 
reach out to me. I'm accessible. I will always generally respond within a day, especially if someone needs help, if they have questions. If the question's answered in the wiki, I will say read the damn wiki. But if it isn't, I'm always happy to to give my time to help someone who is struggling and, and try to show them maybe a, a different path that could get them to where they need to be. Great. Yes, I, I found the Real Day Trading Group on uh, Reddit an excellent source, and your videos on YouTube are also very good at visually seeing what you're talking about uh, using the charts. Great. Great. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, I hope uh, this was uh, educational or helpful in some way to your listeners. Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.